Hello! We have a new OpenHD video for you today and it's something I started quite a while ago after my last OpenHD flights but the way it sort of turned out I was doing a video about one thing and then a bunch of things changed it's kind of turned into another thing but no matter let me talk you through what happened and at the end of the video I'll tell you about what's happening with the code base of OpenHD and the new release that's coming. So in my last video back in September I was flying the Oakin board in the wing. The Oakin board of course being that uh, board that sits on top of the Pi compute module 4 and has all the output ports making it very easy to wire everything up and that was working great but the picture I was getting from OpenHD still wasn't good. We were doing okay but we were still getting lots of breakup, that digital breakup and it wasn't just like quick flickers it was like the screen would go and it looked like some frames were being dropped so I still wasn't that confident about flying it. And I noticed the video got some comments in the Telegram discussion and one of the more experienced users there, Norbert, was saying I was doing a lot of things wrong. So I contacted him and said, oh, you said I was doing things wrong. Please let me know what I'm doing things wrong. And he was really quite apologetic at first and he said, I I'm sorry about the harsh words. I was like, no, 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 that's not why I'm contacting you. It it's more about, yeah, I know this must be wrong because I'm not getting the same sort of picture you and a lot of the other users are tell me what I'm doing wrong because I'd love to put it right because at the moment I, I, I think I'm perhaps the highest profile um, YouTuber flying open HD but I feel I'm not being representative of what it can do so there's guys that are flying a long distance with perfect video but they haven't got sort of bigger subscriber numbers so nobody knows much about it so I don't want to do them a disservice by every time I fly it making it look rubbish Anyway, from this discussion we had two key areas. One of them I knew about and to be fair I hadn't done anything about it for a long time. And it was the use of the USB socket. What I would generally do is make a little fly lead like this with a USB connector, um, plug that in my uh, Wi-Fi adapter and fly like that. And ever since the beginning people had been using the advice about don't do this, you need to wire in directly. This under vibrations can cause little micro disconnections and that can screw up your your video generally and, and everything you're doing. It screws the data rate and everything. And I have to say, earlier on I wasn't too convinced about this, but I thought, you know what, I've got to, I've got to at least commit and do everything I can here. So what it involved doing is trying to take this out and have something to solder into. I hadn't done it before because I was worried about screwing up and these are pretty expensive and I didn't want to have to buy another one because I'd, I'd broken the first one but I went for it and basically you have to prise the outer shell off um, then you can get in and basically dremel off the half the USB connector so you can access the pins solder onto that and then what I did I put some sort of hot glue over it to make sure there was no sort of metal fatigue there and then I heat shrinked everything in made a really small connector because the next piece of advice was about making sure your cable was insulated. This isn't an insulated cable, it's just got regular cables. What you should do is get yourself a regular USB cable, cut the ends off uh, and then use those little ends without without stripping too much back and then all that cable has this really good insulation from a USB. So I did that. That wasn't the main issue though. The main issue was very much about the discoveries that had been made whilst I wasn't doing open HD videos and was out doing other reviews and, and different types of flights. And what was discovered is that the, the ASUS Wi-Fi card, which is very popular because the, the drivers work for it and it, it gets decent sort of range and power, it had this part of the spectrum where it could put out a much higher signal than other places. And the frequencies here are a bit weird. If you're used to dealing with 5.8, FPV, the, the range from 5.8 is not that high, but the range of these excel at is between 5180 and 5320. Now, we'd actually tried on 5320 and I was getting some better results when I was trying stuff in a quad. And when I flicked to the Oaken board, for some reason, the ground station seemed to uh, freeze up using the 5320. It didn't really make sense why, but I hadn't tried um, 5180 so I thought I could try that but switching to that frequency meant something else uh, I'd already heard from Norbert that the the regular FPV antennas I was using the circular polarized stuff just weren't working at all well for open HD and also of course most antennas like this are tuned to about 58 
a uh, hundred uh, so it will have some range back and forth and if you know want to spend extra money you can you can get them tuned exactly to like channel r1 or, or whatever you like but if we drop it down to 5180 we are way outside the range i even spoke to uh, greg at menace rc and said what sort of signal i'm going to get if i'm using a regular antenna and i want to get 51 5180 and he's like you're not going to have a good time it's so far outside the range of what it's tuned for you're just not going to get any decent reception from it however there is an antenna that will work for it and it's called the maple leaf and it's something i hadn't heard of before it's a pcb antenna and it's specifically tuned for these frequencies so i thought brilliant i'll get hold of some of these now getting hold of them is not that easy there's a couple of places where you can buy them people have sort of pre-made them and, and, and sell them on, on various stores but I've, I've never seen them in a the regular fpv shop and what i ended up having to do is use a gerber file and order it through uh, one of those places that can build a pcb for you so i use this place called jlc pcb uh, not sponsoring the video or anything but I'd, I'd recommend doing that because it was surprisingly cheap now i won't lie i needed a bit of help answering some of the questions about like the thickness of the layers and and different things about the pcb but i was able to order five of the antennas from jlc pcb for under five pounds to deliver just over five dollars i think this is what the maple leaf antenna looks like it's pretty simple this is how it comes uh, you'll notice there's a hole here so what i had to do is order some rpsma adapters which for some reason Europe has run out of. So I had to order those from AliExpress, wait a couple of weeks and get them. After that, what I did, I soldered up a couple with a straight end in case I wanted to orientate um, the Wi-Fi adapter upwards and then I could just have that sticking up. And I had some right angle adapters so I could just screw them in like that and have them still pointing upwards. So that bit was all good. Tested it out on the bench using the wing and the picture looked good i still get some flickers inside but there's a lot of um 5.8 noise inside as well so i was like i really need to take this outside to test it but rather than just go out and fly the wing i wanted to try and have two things to fly so i wanted to convert the quad i'd specifically got the iFlight chimera the seven inch quad because it had a very long base and i thought that is a great thing for being able to fit uh, a pi zero in and a camera and i won't have to sort of fiddle about and have it all sort of you know loose because in the last one, basically I did a, a flip and that was enough to flick one of the cables up, catch it in the propellers and the whole thing came down and exploded and I lost my Pi Zero. Speaking of that, you may have noticed that Pi's, Pi 4's, Pi Zero's, Pi Zero 2's, almost every Pi is incredibly difficult to get hold of at the moment unless you talk to one of those awful scalper people. So I have to give huge thanks to a viewer called Ben who saw I had the original Pi broke and he had a spare one he wasn't using and sent it over to me free of charge. Thanks very much, Ben. That was very generous of you and I really do appreciate it. So I started to design some 3D parts that would fit into the Chimera and hold all the pieces. Had some real problems with the camera because the way the, the camera is, is not flat at the, the, the front or the back. You had to make special space and the underneath has to have the ribbon cable. It ended up sticking way out the quad and I decided to, to name it the suicide camera because one slight problem with a landing, that camera's dying. So I got everything built and, and powered up. I made everything quite modular so it was a case of just I could unplug everything and replug it back in with the analog stuff if I wanted to just with different plugs and stuff uh, because I wanted to keep it so I could just move back and forth if I wanted to. However, when I tested it out I had a real problem from the camera everything seemed to be working but the camera gave, gave me sort of the, the top third of a picture and then the rest was complete static so it, it was unusably bad and i wasn't sure why I, I do need to do some more investigation into that but i thought you know what i've spent too long doing this i, I got up to a decent day and i thought let's just fly the oaken wing and see what we can do at least so let's get out to the field and i'll show you what happened well, the cows are back in the field and they seem quite excited to see me. What's happening, cows? I don't know where they think I'm taking them, but they want to come with me. Welcome to the field. It's open HD day. Not quite as uh, calm as I wanted. It's been gusting a bit and I've put the wing out here 
just to get the home position a little bit away away from where I am just because of bush behind me and I don't want it to sort of fly too far behind there we got the normal bits that's the pie and the uh, main supply we've got this for recording the big difference here is the new antennas so I'm going to be launching um, with auto launch put it in return home making sure it's going to circle then get myself in the goggles the goggles breathe on them and the HDMI thing will go out so you know fingers are crossed here Well, there's the launch and I take control pretty quickly. You will notice here that what I do is put it into RTL quite soon and I just don't notice it doing a turn. And I think in retrospect, this is because it it was already on the right course, but I didn't quite trust that. So I put it uh, back into stabilize. I just flew it round and then I flicked it into RTL again and I waited to see if it would do something and it seemed to respond. So I was happy with that. Okay, we think return home's going. Saying so, return home. It's gonna make the actual goggles work. And they're not working currently. Jesus Christ, I'm getting nothing through that. Try rebooting the goggles. Got something, finally. Try and keep head really still. Okay, taking it out of return to home. Okay, see what I am here. Okay, we are flying and we've got a reasonably good picture. Now, as per usual, my intent here was to sit down, give some commentary whilst I was flying. But whilst I was concentrating mostly on not moving my head, I didn't actually speak too much or I sort of muttered quietly to myself. So I just have to talk you through it in voiceover. My instant reaction to flying here was, wow, this is quite an improvement. You will still see we get the odd flash of corruption coming up a frame. And you can see in the top left there, you've got a lost packet ratio. And although the number's going up, it stays at 0%, which is sort of the, the ratio of lost packets to packets that got there is, is much, much higher. So although we do get some, uh, we've getting about a 7% loss, and that was causing some real problems. I don't know why we're still getting these little flickers, but in the majority of the part, it's very, very uh, flyable indeed. And, you know, I'm, I kind of like what I'm seeing here. We are getting buffeted about a bit. It's a bit windier than I wanted. Um, the main thing I was also looking at as well is the artificial horizon indicator. Last time this went a bit crazy and I'd made some changes for the mounting of the flight controller which I felt was, was going pretty well. The only thing I'd say, and this is uh, turned out to be my undoing as you'll see later, is for some reason instead of flicking the plane to manual um, I left it in stabilize which is a, a weird thing to do. Now Putting it in stabilised was was fine when I was flying line of sight. It just helped me make the turns and made sure I you know I didn't lose my orientation. But for normal flying, manual should have been a lot smoother. And I've absolutely no idea why I didn't put it away from stabilised. I think I was just concentrating more about the flying and what sort of distance we could get without any sort of breakup. I was keeping an eye on the the Wi-Fi DBM there, and it's a pretty good. Uh, rate actually minus 66 minus 70 for this sort of distance is is absolutely fine on the other side of things on the the top right we've got the rssi and now this thing doesn't pick up like link quality and stuff at the moment and you'll notice some other stuff's missing like if we look at the distance to home it shows up as zero and basically the telemetry is there this version of open hd just isn't picking up some of the stuff from beta flight now this isn't going to be fixed because they're working on the new version and I'll, I'll come back to that a bit later and there's lots of reasons you know why they're not going to go back and fix the old stuff it's mostly because that code is is messy and they've got the new stuff so i'm going for it a little bit here because this is as far as i've been on open hd um if you're familiar with me testing out analog vtx's you will know this is between 
uh, 1 and 1.4 kilometers. We, we hit about 1.4, 1.5 when we hit the sea. We never quite go that far because I don't want to fly over sort of roads or other people's houses and stuff. All this space I'm flying over at the moment is, is farmland that I've got specific permission to fly over and so I'm kind of in control of that as it were. But yeah, that, that's much better than I've ever seen it and much further than I've been out before and uh, the pitch is pretty good. I would say the goggles. The goggles are an absolute nightmare. This is perhaps half the fault of the goggles. You see me, I'm using these big uh, box goggles because they're the only ones I've got that can do a 1080p picture and have an HDMI in. The problem is with these HDMI cables, they're just not built for the sort of work we're doing here. They are big, thick cables, the ends are very stiff and they're very heavy so they, they're always sort of pulling down on the socket and you know they only need a tiny little bit of movement from a very inflexible wire and it's quite possible that the HDMI could disconnect and this is what I, what I had I sat down I didn't have any picture in the goggles I had to reboot the goggles all the time of course I'm, I'm trusting the RTH to keep circling around and we sort of eventually got there I mean I love the fact that walks now have a USB-C to HDMI output but of course they don't have an input so that's not much use to me but yeah we, we need to do something about the sort of cables we can use here because these H big HDMI cables are absolutely terrible. I have to say that the camera was pretty dodgy going into this sort of darker area it's it's wide dynamic range isn't anything like as good as the the, the modern analog cameras that we've got it's just uh, pretty terrible. But um, yeah, I am I am pretty happy here. The wing is flying pretty well. The battery is lasting. The telemetry, for the most part, is coming out, except the uh, the home distance. It's it's weird that it calculates my overall distance. You see down the bottom towards the right there, but it can't seem to calculate distance from home, even though it's got a lat long. It knows where my home position is. So who knows? Perhaps that's just a bit of telemetry that's not getting through properly. Now I'm going to fast forward a, a few minutes into the flight because this is where it went a bit wrong for me and it's completely my fault for being unstabilised. As I was flying about a bit further into the flight I started to know that the artificial horizon indicator is starting to go out and I was like oh no I thought I'd fix that. That's really annoying. But of course if the gyro or the accelerometer thinks it's out of line then stabilise is going to start trying to stabilize in a, in a weird way and I found myself starting to fight with the plane again I don't know why I just didn't flick the button once you start concentrating on one thing and you know it's a slightly unfamiliar model and you're sort of concentrating on one thing you kind of lose focus on the other stuff so what happened is I thought you know what I'm going to bring this down for a landing we can we can reset everything and it'll be fine and um, it'll be fine on the second flight uh, of course to, to bring it down for a landing meant, meant I had to turn it around and come down and you can see as I'm just turning a bit here the AHI is going absolutely mental uh, and at some point it turns almost completely upside down and that's when the wings sort of seem to panic I'm fighting with the flight controller the flight controller is turning me around I'm trying to turn back why didn't you just hit manual and uh, basically what happens is we end up going into a, a nice spinny dive and uh, crashing into the bush. Okay, we had a problem with stabilisation and then the thing turned over and crashed into a bush, which was pretty annoying. I think I can see where it is. Okay, so there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is I found the plane and it seems to be relatively safe. The bad news is it's, the, it's out there, which is kind of far away from me on the ground. It's about, I don't know, 12, 15 feet up. Uh, so I thought I'd go have a word with Graham the Farmer, see if he's got any suggestions before I try and just randomly climb up that very dodgy looking hedgerow. We are in the tractor. Yeah. Let's get in the plane. Let's uh, hope this works. Yeah. That was slightly terrifying. <laughs> 
So what was the damage from that crash? Well, it wasn't nothing, but it wasn't too bad. Obviously, you can see we've got a bunch of scrapes here. We've got a couple of small rips and holes along here. Nothing too bad. The camera got a bunch of dirt on it, but I know that's working because I could see it in the bush. Uh, the most significant thing is here is we lost one of our new antennas. Uh, I'm glad to say that ripped out on the antenna side rather than this side. Now you're probably thinking, oh no, that's bad because it was working without an antenna for all that time. But these actually have an internal antenna and uh, obviously I could see the picture, so I'm hoping that's okay. It obviously hit a branch which was quite hard and it went in a couple of inches here. So we've got kind of a rip here and you can probably see on the other side, this goes back a bit, but I just basically need to fill that and then re-laminate and that should be good as gold. I've only just seen this. There is, um, we've still got some here. Hang on. Yeah, so another piece of damage here where this, this went in. Again, there's just a bit of filling of that. There, you can see it's made a bit of a hole. It's gone along the ridge line there and, and got a couple of little rips. I'll, I'll check the rest out because I didn't see that bit. But yeah, other than those more bits than I thought, just look at it, it's, it's all okay, thankfully. Now, when Graham said get in the tractor bucket, I thought he was having a bit of a joke, but no, he was completely serious. Unfortunately, he was a very proficient tractor driver because it was quite hard there and, and quite frightening. Now, I can't say that every farmer is going to give you a lift up to get your plane back. It probably helps that Graham is also my brother-in-law and thus I've got a little bit more sway than normal. Anyway, we got the plane back. It was, it was okay. Some things I'll be doing differently for next time is finding the source of these vibrations. Obviously, the artificial rise indicator is a good indication that something's going skew with in like the gyro. It's being perhaps bounced about and that makes it go a bit strange. So um, I can improve the mounting. I can do a bit more soft mounting there so it, it sort of has a little bit more room to absorb the vibrations. I can also check out, I've got a vibration app on my phone which I often put on planes, spin the prop up and then I try and dynamically balance the prop by turning it around in the collet until you find a place where it's less vibration. So I'll be doing that. Also, that plane is currently running iNav 4.0, so I'll be upgraded to a later version. The reason I didn't upgrade it this time is when I'm making a lot of changes, I don't want to change them in multiple places because if something had gone wrong, more wrong than it did, then I wouldn't be sure if it, it, is it because I did the upgrade, is it because I did these changes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I sort of wait um, if I know something's flying well, try it, then I come back and do the upgrade. But what of OpenHD? What's happening there? So in the last video, I did mention that OpenHD was going through some big changes. What had happened is one of the developers that was most active in the project, he was sort of rewriting it and he, he talked about putting out version three and then he left the project and he left it in, in a, a bit of a state really, because it turned out, aside from the fact he had this unfinished version of version three, it also turned out later on down the line we found that some of the images were hosted on external servers instead of on GitHub. And when the hosting stuff ran out, the images disappeared. So the image I actually was using on the wing was put back on GitHub, but only because someone found it on their hard drive and could put it back there. So the stuff they were left with was not enough to actually build the images with. So the guys that took over sort of looked at the code that was left looked at the structure of it and said this is no good it needs to be rewritten from scratch in a in a, in a decent way uh in c plus plus in a really structured way that makes sense and is consistent throughout the whole project this this is no easy task we, you, you're taking something that's working and you're basically saying don't do that but let's re-implement it in, in a good way so it took them a good six months just to get the basic features working and it's been uh i think close to a year now since since we were talking about the new version and they're finally at a stage where they've got the release candidate ready, which is called OpenHD Evo 2.3.4. And they've done some more impressive things here. They're, they're putting in support, apart from Raspberry Pi, the NVIDIA Jetson, like the Jetson Nano. They've got support in for x86 Linux only at this point. They're improving the GUI so you can change the settings by that. Previously, we had to go in and look at config files in the sort of Linux file system. Now the idea is you go into a GUI, you can change various things, most of which you can do on the fly as well while you're sort of in the air and stuff. They've also added support for lib camera, which won't mean much to you perhaps. Just know that instead of like a couple of Pi cameras that were supported, 
lib camera opens up a lot more options for you so it's, it's you don't have to spend a lot and, and try and get weird cameras that are very hard to fit into quads now on the downside they've had to drop support for the lower powered pies to the pi 1 the original pi 2 and the pi 0 and of course i was using the pi 0 on that quad uh, the Pi Zero 2 supported, so I have to get one of those to fly, and they are difficult to get hold of at the moment. So fingers crossed that we get proper supplies coming back soon. Now, I haven't tested out the new version of OpenHD Evo yet, despite being on the testers group. The reason being, not because I don't trust it, I'm perfectly happy to fly it, but they hadn't rewritten the, the app called Q OpenHD. This is what runs on Android. Uh, and that's how I record all my flights and I kind of need to record stuff just to see what's happening and if I crash I can look at the GPS coordinates and stuff like that. This is within a few days I, I've been told of being on, on the Play Store and being available. So as soon as that comes in I will download it and get the, the new version of OpenHD Evo onto the plane and test it out that way. Uh, and this links back to why some of the things weren't being fixed before like we had that problem with 5320 hanging the ground station and we had the problem with some of the telemetry not working that's in the old version the old version's dead it's all about the evo and of course if we're still getting those problems on the new version that they will be looked at and bugs will be fixed of course so feel free to check that out I'll, I'll put some links down below from where you can check out like the new version and some of the the new uh, documentation and i'll come back as soon as that's all available and i can shove it back on the plane and do another test flight hopefully with uh without crashing into a bush this time anyway i hope that's been helpful and uh, i will catch you next video bye for now well you've made it to the end of the video so thanks once again for watching if you like what you saw then please consider subscribing and if you really like what you saw then be sure to check out the link to my blog for a variety of ways in which you can help support this channel